Well, here's the big debate. Who needs to win more, Florida or Florida State this weekend, man? I have no clue, but we're going to ask somebody that does, and that's Matt Baker of the Tampa Bay Times. What in the heck is going on in Gainesville and in Tallahassee? USF looking to bounce back. UCF is one of the better teams in the state, along with Miami. So we got some national games. We got everything to talk about with Matt Baker of the Tampa Bay Times. Uh, talking college football here in just a second. Hey, uh, we, we we made an audible. We did a Liam Cohen like, to Baker Mayfield. We said, hey, if you don't like this play, go with this play. We're going to go for your mailbag questions tonight. We, we had Matt instead. Um, that's our call. I think we're going to score a touchdown with it. Believe me, this you're going to love this content. But tomorrow we will have our mailbag segment, and that means you still have time. That's right. If you haven't sent it in, now you have no excuse. You can do that on Twitter at SportsDayTB. You can reach me on Twitter at NFL Stroud or my email address is rstroud at tampabay.com. All right, we're joined now by Jeff Hess at Breitling Boutique in the International Plaza Mall. And, Jeff, it's great to talk to you. I love to talk about watches because nothing uh, you know is more exciting than buying a, a brand-new Swiss watch. One of the best brands in the business is Breitling. This store I've been to a bunch of times. It's it, Your customer service is exemplary. But let's start with sort of like the, the popular brands that uh, that you you do. I know you have men's and women's watches. You have sports watches. Let's talk about the Chronomats because that's the one that I'm I'm most familiar with, and 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 maybe one of your more popular watches. Well, Cr- Chronomat is of course probably uh, that's the watch a lot of people think about when they uh, when they buy a Breitling, and uh, especially their first Breitling. And the Chronomat's been around for about sixty or seventy years. It started off with the uh, but with Breitling's strong, strong, strong support of the military. Mm-hmm. And that's where the whole chronomat thing comes uh, comes around. These watches are chronometers. I'm, I'm sure you know what that means. Right. That means they've been tested with Swiss agencies to keep precision time within plus to minus six seconds per day, which is pretty incredible for a uh, for an automatic watch. Yeah, absolutely, and and they're absolutely spectacular. They're beautiful. What are some of the more? Because uh, you have a variety of those. Uh, obviously, you explain the why, but what what are sort of the variety of watches you have in the Chronomats? Well, the Chronomat comes in a myriad of styles and a myriad of sizes as mm-hmm. well. You know, back in the day, it was a little thirty six, thirty seven millimeter watch, and Breitling made these things for a lot of military. Uh, a lot of countries around the world. Now today, uh, they come anywhere from 38 millimeters for ladies, which used to be a man's size watch, but today that's considered a ladies' watch. And by the way, some of the 38 millimeter ones are really awesome. Uh, a lot of times we call them unisex because a guy with a, a slimmer wrist, it looks really good on him. But uh, some of these things come with incredible dials, beautiful, beautiful hues. Uh, the blue one and the green one are probably the most popular. And then they go all the way up to 43, 44 millimeters. They, they're they pretty beefy, uh, the, the bigger chronomats. And uh, these are exemplary watches, obviously. Tell me sort of the price range. I know everything varies, um, but what are we looking at if, if we were interested in, in buying one of those chronomats? Well, you know what? Breitling has changed their uh, focus, and they, of course, are a luxury watch. Mm-hmm. And it's not unusual for us to sell uh, for an 18 karat gold watch right. for twenty to twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, but you can walk into the boutique and you can get a really cool entry level Breitling for as little as three thousand now, because they want to kind of reach everybody. Yeah, and of course, you know, once you buy that first one, typically you'll come in and buy another <laughs> one. Absolutely, these are gorgeous watches. Jeff Hess, go see him at Breitling Boutique International Plaza Mall. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate it. Best time of the week, best time of the year. We get to talk college football with Matt Baker of the Tampa Bay Times. You read him also on tampabay.com. And, Matt, let's start with the Florida Gators because, goodness gracious, they needed a win, any win, and they'll take it, obviously, against always tough Sanford. But more importantly, eh, got to see the young stud quarterback, DJ Lagway. I got to be honest with you, anytime you can go in there and throw for 456, I don't care who it's against, with some of the plays that he made, looked really, really good. So given the, where Billy Napier is with this program right now, is it Graham Mertz? Is it DJ Lagway? What are they going to do here? 
It, the answer seems to be both. And, you know, I'm going to pause here for a caveat. I'm assuming Graham Mertz is, is healthy enough to play. Right. Um, we're, we're recording this Tuesday night. Billy will give an update on, on Wednesday, as he does always with, with injury stuff. Um, as of Monday, Graham uh, was going to be ready for a non-contact practice. And then there's, I guess, a couple more things they got to go through the concussion protocol, but I'm working under the assumption for purposes of this conversation that he is healthy enough to play on Saturday. Cause believe it or not, there are things more important than football and somebody's brain is one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's going to be both is, is the answer. You know, my assumption is that Graham Mertz is going to start. And I say that because Billy has not exactly said so, but he was asked a couple of different ways about this Saturday and then also on Monday and, and right after the game, he was asked basically is, is Graham, Graham Mertz isn't going to get Wally pipped here, right? Where he's not going to lose a starting job because of injury. And, and, and Billy said, no. So I'm working under the assumption that means he's going to start, but both of them are, are going to play both, both Graham and, and DJ. And it's going to be very interesting to see how it works for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Right. I mean, uh, how are the fans going to react? How mm-hmm. does Graham react? How does DJ react? Um, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of <laughs> whole bunch of layers to this one. You know, I, I mean, I understand there is this uh, sort of axiom in football that if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have any. But listen, both those guys are talented in their own way. I guess the question is, who can function better behind this offensive line? Who can make plays if things aren't, you know, uh, if things break down, um, and, and this is an sec team. So you, you also have to be aware that, you know, Lagway has not played this level in college yet. Um, but, but do you, I mean, you kind of buy or sell this. I mean, how do you, how do you work a two quarterback system? I know teams have done it. Um, but in general, you know how locker rooms are, Matt. I mean, guys are going to have an opinion and they may not express it, but you, you divide the quarterback position. You can divide the locker room as well, and certainly the fan base. Yeah, and I've I've seen it work. Where let me rephrase that: I've seen it not work super well. You know, like like with what Florida did with 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 Emory and Trask, it, it wasn't like bad necessarily, but it, I don't know that it also worked out exactly either. It was just kind of it was just kind of there where I didn't understand. It seemed like whenever Florida crossed the forty, okay, Emory's going to come out. And he's going to take the field for a couple of plays and be like, what, what did, what did you get out of this? Um, so I'll give you an, another example. This one's very relevant is when uh, Billy Napier was at Louisiana Lafayette in 2018, they had a, a, a really veteran guy, Andre Nunez. And then they had a young guy, I guess he was a redshirt freshman or sophomore Levi Lewis who hadn't played as much. And, and so it was a very similar dynamic. Levi ended up being one of the best, most prolific passers in, in ULL history, um, really athletic, but he didn't, I don't necessarily think he knew the offense and just, he just didn't have the experience that Andre did. So what Billy ended up doing for most of 2018 is the first three series would go to Andre, the, the incumbent, the grand Mertz in, in this scenario. And then series four would go to, to Levi Lewis, the, the DJ Lagway in this scenario. And, just looking over the box scores and going through the, the play-by-play um, earlier, Billy stuck to that. And, and here's what I mean by that is there was one, uh, one of the games where um, I think it was against app state. Um, anyway, one of the games where uh, Andre starts out and it's three and out, three and out and fumble. And then, uh, you know, the, Levi comes in and has a really good drive and then it goes back to Andre. So you think like, maybe that's a scenario where you make the switch permanent. No, you don't. And the other side of that w- was true as well, where I guess it was uh, against Louisiana Monroe, I think, where Andre starts out, touchdown, 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 like nine of nine passing, literally could not do much better. And then for a series, just like always, he's yanked and, and, and Levi comes in. So my point is Billy has done this before with some level of success. They were, you know, they made the Sunbelt Championship game in Billy's first year. They're in, they were they were better, right? Um, there's just a whole... There's so many factors that we have to consider in all of this, right? I mean, first and foremost, who is the best chance to win the game on on Saturday? And I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, 
Billy chose Graham Mertz as the starter for the reason, for, for a reason, I should say. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Billy chose Graham Mertz to play pretty much all of the Miami game or play all of the Miami game until he got hurt, pres- presumably for a reason. Um, he's he's watched a lot of practice and, and you know, Graham physically doesn't have what, what DJ has. Uh, I mean, DJ's supremely gifted. And we can talk more about that in a second. Um, but Graham has played a ton of college football. Like, I, I think he's working on like his third PhD at this point is what it seems like. Um, but, you know, they've used the kind of the example in the past where Graham, at this point, he, he is doctorate level college football. And, and DJ is still learning algebra. And, and, you know, he's, he's learning fast. He, he's learning on the job and all that stuff's good. But there's going to be scenarios where you take a guy like Mike Elko, the, the head coach at Texas A&M, one of the brighter defensive minds in the game. He's going to do some stuff that's going to confuse an inexperienced quarterback, any inexperienced quarterback. So how much is that going to matter versus, I mean, look, I, I know DJ was playing against Sanford, right? I, I, I saw it. Sanford is not good. Um, Florida's receivers were very open. That will not be the case against Texas A&M or against Georgia or against whoever, right? The level of competition is different. However, I have eyes. I saw the way DJ Lagway threw the ball. The, the one, it was a 41 yarder. He threw to, to Aiden Mizell on the right side of the end zone. I had to think about it. That's the best throw I've seen by a Florida quarterback since the, the heave to cleave the you know, Felipe Franks bombed to Tyree Cleveland to beat Tennessee in 2017. I, I think that's the list in terms of 2015 when I, when I got this job. So DJ and DJ did that in his first start. So he is supremely gifted. There's a lot of good in there. Um, it's a matter of just how much good um, too quickly. Right. And, and what are the, the pros and cons there? And you know, how much does Billy care about saving his job potentially? Because if, there's not enough on-field progress than if you can sell hope because you know what? We don't have the wins right now, but we got this quarterback, right? That's something that you can sell. Um, and how much of it is just kind of developing DJ for, for down the line too. So th- there's just a lot of factors here that's going to go into, into the four quarters and, and how Billy decides to, to play this. But I mean, it's, it's absolutely pivotal. He's got to get this right. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's never worked, but it rarely works, right? Like, there's always somebody that's either going to be a fan favorite, a uh, bigger pedigree, um, and 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 I I will say this that like they have different skill sets too. Okay, mm-hmm. so you're you're asking your play caller or your offense, you know, uh, designer uh, coordinator um, to to have sort of two game plans in a sense. I mean, you'd like to think that the same guy can run the same offense, and I'm sure there's a lot of crossover, but they don't have the same skill set. So, you know, one guy might do it more from the pocket. The other guy, you might want to move a little bit and give him some run pass options. Like, and, and all those offenses have that. Um, but, but I do think that, look, I, I don't know how many more SEC games Florida has a chance to win. I think they have a chance to win this one, okay? Um, Texas A&M is unranked like they are. They got them, they got them where, they, where they want them. Um, but by the same token – there is something to you, you. You can sell hope with the young kid at some point, but it, it it may be for some other coach, right? Like, I don't know that there's there's a guarantee that that if Billy doesn't win and and start winning here fairly soon and at least enough games to show that progress, that he's going to be the one coaching this kid. So, isn't there? isn't the immediacy of the situation kind of lean you to say? And and by the same token, I agree with you, Matt. Like, you can't put a guy out there that's unprepared. You know, you if if he's not ready to play against this level of competition, then it's going to get things aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. So, I mean, I guess that's all the evaluation for the coaches. But just to declare that you're going to play them both, it's going to be really interesting. Do you go with the hot hand, for example? Right, guy has a good series. No, no, no. You're going to go and and now it's this guy's. Like, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see how they do it. I guess. Yeah, for, for sure. And again, I, I went back and looked at the, the what Billy did in 2018, where it was, it was a tight. It, it was a little different because it was a competition that really went on during uh, during the summer, during training camp and what have you. And then uh, Andre won and they liked him better of what he could do. But also Levi is good enough to play. So we we're going to play him as well. That was a thought process. And it was Billy was pretty direct at times, too, where he said, basically, we're going to have a game plan going into it and everyone's going to know what it is. Um, like I said, most of the time it appeared to be where, you know, uh, Andre plays three series and then Levi is, is, is four. Um, 
and the thought process there was we don't want to be in a situation where exactly what you were saying, right? Where Andre's looking over his shoulder and okay, is leave, you know, I just went out and threw a pick. Am I screwed? No, you, you're going to get your three series and then we're going to switch. And, and the reverse would be true as well. So I guess the key there is communication where everybody kind of knows what the plan is. But yes, to your point, what if the plan's not working? What if it, I'm just making this up, but what if they switch off series and DJ you know, is not looking very good and Graham is looking quite sharp or, or the reverse, right? Somebody's working, somebody's not. At what point do you abandon the plan? And, and it, there's just a lot of issues here and you don't want to mess up DJ in terms of long term, but you also can't afford to lose. But if you don't develop DJ, then and that hope isn't there. I mean, look, this was the first time we, uh, after the game, um, DJ uh, was able to talk to us since, since he arrived because freshmen are usually off limits. But they're, they, you know, DJ was the first exception they've made under Billy. And somebody asked him at the end, basically, why, why did you come here? Right? Because we haven't had a chance to talk to him and ask him that directly. And the first thing he said was Coach Napier. I think that's relevant here. Where if we, again, I'm not reporting this, I'm not speculating this, but. I guess I am speculating, but he, he, hear me out. If we play this out and let's say this doesn't go well for Billy this season and he's on the hot seat and he, he gets fired, you know, in that scenario, which I'm not reporting as fact and DJ came here because of Billy, right? You can see how that goes. Um, because we've, believe me, we have seen it plenty of times before in, in various ways, shapes and forms. So I guess I'm saying DJ's future is something that has to be considered as we look at everything in terms of Texas A&M, Mississippi State next week, the rest of the season, Billy, DJ's future is part of this whole conversation. Um, and it's just going to be fascinating to see how it plays out starting Saturday against the Aggies. Okay, quarterback aside, where are there other problems? I mean, I, I don't think, you know, obviously the quarterback is, is going to be the focal point of any team um, that's winning or losing. But in, in essence, do they have other areas that they have to shore up or it doesn't really matter what that guy behind the center does? Yeah. Um, all of them except for special teams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. Well, I mean, look, we, we watched, which is we, ironic we watched, because special teams counting used to be the problem here. It, it correct. Felt. Correct. Um, they, they, they had issues with that and they, and they got it fixed and, and excuse me, against Miami, the, uh, the, the special teams were, were pretty strong. Um, but seriously though, the, the run game didn't do much against Miami, the offensive line, certainly didn't do what it was supposed to do. The defensive front didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, the secondary in part, because the, the defensive front didn't get uh, enough pressure. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't look great. And all those things are an issue here. Whereas to, to me, we can, we can get the quarterback. Yes. That, that is matter. That matters. We are going to pay attention to it. It's going to be a huge storyline, but the offensive line has to play better than it did against Miami. And the defense has to get some sort of pressure and avoid the, just the, the breakdowns that they had against the Canes. Otherwise, Texas A&M, you know, they're not a, a great team, but they're still very talented. And I think they're going to be very well coached. If Florida plays the way it did against Miami, then we're talking about Texas A&M rolling out of there with probably a double digit victory. And uh, a lot of the goodwill that happened in Gainesville because of DJ Lagway's performance and, and the, the win over Sanford, that stuff is, is going to show up. Um, it, it, the noises are not going to go away. And, and I just want to say one more thing on the defense here. You know, you know how it is when you're, you're watching a game and you're writing a story as it goes and, and things kind of ebb and flow uh, early on in my, my kind of running story, I pointed out that the defense was not impressive. Because in the first half, they gave up a third and 10. They give up two third and eights against Samford. If you do that stuff against Samford, then Connor Wegman and Texas A&M and a team that still has talent, they're going to be able to, to, to kind of pick you apart. And that's just a concern that I have based on what I've seen for <laughs> the last several years of Florida football um, predating Billy. But yeah, that, the defense has to get a lot better. Yeah, and no, I, I think they have a lot of issues, and, and I don't know how much time Billy has, but listen, uh, this would be a huge, huge get for them to uh, be able to knock off a and whoever plays quarterback, and, and they're going to have to play certainly better as a team. Let, let's go to Florida State, because i got to be honest with you, Matt. I, I didn't see them starting the season the way they have, and there is something that um, 
you know, is a, a little awry with the program. And, and listen, they had a great team a year ago, a national contender. We know what happened, you know, with the injuries to the quarterback, et cetera. And they lost a lot of good players to the NFL. And, and that, that's college football. And, and mm-hmm. it happens with every team and every, um, you know, happens to Alabama, happens to Georgia, happens to everybody. Um, but that said, this was a team that has done really well in the transfer portal. You wrote a story in the Tampa Bay Times and on TampaBay.com that I thought was fascinating. We know FSU is failing, but why? Yeah, I, I mean, some of it is a natural regression to the mean. Where I mean, you you mentioned Georgia and, and Alabama as as you know they lose really good players. They're able to replace them because they recruit at, and develop at an elite level. Yeah, there there's there's two of them. Throw Ohio State in there if you want, right? But but that's it. That's the list. Everybody else is going to regress to the mean. Um, the the main thing to me though is, is it's some of it is recruiting, but some of it the bigger issue is talent development. You know, Florida state recruited at a decent level, a top 25 level um, every year they've had Norvell and they're not producing, they're not developing those blue chip guys. You know, I think they signed 21 blue chip players, the first three classes and really about four of them have really panned out. That's not a good hit rate. And, and again, there's a bunch of reasons why, you know, the first recruiting class is a transition. So you're recruiting, you know, it's, it is that is a speed dating thing where you're recruiting somebody in a span of days or weeks rather than months and years. So you're going to have more misses. Okay, I, I get that. And then the second class that it was COVID. So, you know, I, I get that too. That's a little weird. But but his third class just hasn't really panned out. And that's surprising and, and a concern for me. It, it makes you wonder how good is he and the staff as evaluators when it comes to high school players? Um, how good are, th- are they at developing th- those type of players? Just because they did it at Memphis, but the track record at Florida state so far has been unimpressive. And, and the example that that just comes to mind is receivers. You know, I, I think I've said this before on here, but uh, a couple years ago, I think it was probably his first year, maybe end of Willie, the Florida State's receivers were just not impressive. They were not good. And that's inexplicable. It's inexcusable. And you look at just the the guys that he's brought in and the touted enough receivers in his, in his classes, and they just haven't panned out. And that's why they had to go try and get a Malik Benson or get a, a, a Jalen Brown from LSU. And you know, obviously, Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman before that. And, and eventually, that lack of development just kind of caught up to him and, and put him in this position now where – there's not a lot of skill talent, or I should say not as much skill talent as I would have thought. And then you add in the other stuff where the offensive line's not as good and, and this talented defensive line's not playing up to its potential and you get that that 0-2 start. But you know, it, I'm really interested in uh, this, this Florida State-Memphis game on Saturday, yes. probably more so than just about it, really kind of any in the country in some ways. Yeah, tell me about that because I, I listen. Memphis has had some good teams. Obviously, um, it, it's a different conference. Some would think not maybe as good, uh, even as the ACC right now, especially with the way Miami and, and uh, others are playing. Um, but what, what, what intrigues you about this matchup in particular? Uh, well, for, first of all, Memphis is good. Um, you, you know, they, they they won their first two games fairly handily. Again, it was North Alabama and Troy, so whoop de doo. We're not making a big deal out of it. But you know, Ryan Silverfield was the the online coach under uh, Norvell at Memphis, and he's kind of I don't want to say he's built the program because the program was already built, but he's been able to keep it going. And, and early on in his tenure, it didn't look like that would happen. But to his credit, he kind of righted the ship and. You know, now they're one of, or arguably the premier program in the mid-major G5 level, whatever you want to call it. Um, as I look at this matchup, though, it, it's different than Georgia Tech and Boston College for Florida State, um, just because the way the teams are built. Georgia Tech w- was built on as an, you know, they were built by a former offensive line coach. Their offensive line is one of the best, or maybe the best in the ACC. They were going to d- r- use it that way w- with a running quarterback too, and Haynes King. So you can see how that played out. Boston College has r- pretty darn good running backs too, including Trayshawn Ward, former Noel from uh, Tampa Bay Tech, um, and, and with a really good running quarterback in Thomas Castellano. So that's how they were able to kind of 
pound their way. And the line was good, and Florida State's D-line underachieved. I'm not minimizing that. But Memphis is just built a different way. Seth Hennigan's one of the better quarterbacks, certainly at the mid-major level, maybe in the country. He's really, really good. They're going to be able to throw, or they're going to try to throw the ball around a lot. And just because of what they're good at, I don't know that they're going to try to run the ball down Florida State's throat the, the way that the other teams did, or if they're going to be able to. So I think this is just a different, you know, styles make fights, that kind of thing. Um, I think Florida State might have a better chance here just because this is something that might lean more on their secondary than than their defensive front. And that's a matchup that maybe Florida State has a better chance of that, at least as I'm trying to justify how they're a six and a half point favorite in this one. Okay, quickly, who needs to win more? Florida or Florida State this week? <sighs> um, <laughs> well, for different reasons, obviously. I yeah, mean, listen, it, Florida is, is it, Napier is up against it, right? I mean, we, you look yeah. at the schedule and you say, where are the wins? I, I, I think people recognize that, you know, that Florida State is in a different place from a program standpoint. I mean, that's fair, right? Yeah, 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 for, for sure. Um, you know, Billy's got to get some wins, and, and there's only so many on this schedule. I mean, you start looking at, at the back half. George is awesome. Texas kicked the crap out of Michigan. Texas might be awesome, too. Um, Ole Miss is just kicking the crap. Again, Ole Miss hasn't played anybody yet. We'll, we'll get there when we get there, but they look really impressive. Tennessee, to me, is... I don't want to call them the most surprising team in the country. I don't think that's fair, but they're playing at a level I didn't think they could where, you know, I had them in like the 15 range on my AP ballot. And I think I put them up to, to seven this week and probably should have put them six. Honestly, they kicked the crap out of NC state. Nico, their quarterback looks awesome. The defense looks pretty darn good too. So you start looking at that and okay, where are the wins? Where are the wins for Florida? And a and is a winnable game. Do I think the Gators will win? No, I do not. But it is a game where it is winnable. And there are only so many on this schedule. And if Billy's going to get to a bowl and get to six wins and, you know, have a chance of, of keeping his job and, and going into, you know, the, the re- December recruiting and all that stuff, it, it, the wins have to come. Florida State is, it is different, right? Where, you know, they've had a couple of defections on the recruiting trail and, and it is certainly fair to question the direction of the program right now, but they could still salvage things. There's, there's enough games left on, on that schedule where they can salvage respectable. Um, Billy, it, it's, it's tougher to see that if they lose this one. Yeah, I totally agree. That's good analysis right there. Okay, uh, I wanted to mention, uh, talk about winnable games. Look, I, no one expected, I don't think, uh, that USF would go up and, and take down Alabama. But lo and behold, um, there they were, Matt, like in the fourth quarter, down by what, a point, I think. And then and then they caved in on them, right? Um, Crimson Tide did things and got big plays in the defense, whatever. But what did you make of, of that performance? And specifically, do we know yet how good USF could be? Well, we know they're good enough to hang with one of the top five teams in the country for 54 minutes, right? We, 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 we do know that that, that happened. And, and you know, maybe you could say there was some fluky stuff in there or whatever, but no, it, it, it happened. For the second year in a row, uh, they hung with a very, very good team. Um, at some point, if USF is going to get to where they want to go, they got to learn how to close out games. Um, but to me, it was just one of those measuring sticks along the way. How do they s- stack up against one of the best in the country? And they were able to, to hang with them for a bit. Um, it, but it, it's, you know, a team like Alabama, that they're going to expose your weaknesses, right? They're going to stress test you and show you what the issues are. Um, the passing game obviously wasn't as sharp as it usually is. Um, Alex Golish, uh, the head coach, took some. You know, he took the heat on, on that. All right, it fell on the sword, I guess I should say, um, during his news conference on Tuesday, saying it's, it, he didn't put him in a position to get into rhythm and what have you. Also, Alabama is really good, so let's not minimize that. Uh, and, and the defense just kind of—I don't know if they got tired or just kind of. You know, Alabama did what they do um, at the end there. So to me, it was a lesson that Al- that that USF is still on the right track. No, the, they were not happy with the results or anything, but I'm not in that locker room. I can objectively look at it and say they had they put up a good fight and 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 ha- had a fine game. And, and to me, it was, a, it was a reminder that USF is moving in the right direction. And you know, they they've got a team Southern Miss on Saturday that's not 
that good. You know, a familiar face, Tate Rodemaker, the uh, former, actually of one time USF commit back when Kerwin right. Bell. When uh, when Kerwin w- was an assistant with the Bulls and ended up at Florida State and started against the, the Gators there at the end, um, so you know he's a talented guy. He's played, you know, been around a lot of teams, played a lot of you know practice a lot, even hasn't shown up on the field. And so they've they've got a good quarterback, Southern Miss. So I give them that. But this is one that USF should absolutely win and, and win probably by by double digits and, and start feeling. Uh, you know, maybe like they got a chance against Miami or can at least be competitive with them again before they go into uh, conference play. What I love about college football, Matt, is that it's unpredictable, right? Who Northern Illinois taking down Notre Dame, goodness mm-hmm. gracious. I mean, who saw that sort of thing? Uh, but there's there's a lot of interesting games this week. I'm going to give it to you and you tell me which ones have, have sort of piqued your interest on, on uh, starting really Thursday. Yeah, we're going to start with the one that I know you're excited about. Arizona State, Texas State, Thursday night. <laughs> no idea why you picked that. <laughs> well, but both of them are undefeated. You know, Arizona State um, has turned the corner early in Kenny Dillingham's tenure, maybe a earlier than I thought. Uh, Kenny's a former Florida State assistant under Norvell. Everybody in the industry thinks he's a really sharp guy. And you know, ASU hasn't been great. Um, but he's from Arizona. He, he's got the potential to, to kind of wake that program up and make them what they should be, which is a, a good program in, in the Big 12. Texas State on the other side, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there's not a lot of people listening to this podcast who have strong thoughts on the Bobcats. They went really heavy in the transfer portal under G.J. Kenny early on in his tenure. Their quarterback, Jordan McLeod, who was at USF, was at uh, Arizona, was you know, one of the better quarterbacks in the country last year at James Madison. A Tampa guy from, I believe, Sickles High School, um, if I remember right, where he ended up. Or, and Plant also played at Plant. Um, but th- that's a game that has a chance to be very pointsy and absolutely can matter in the playoff race. With Texas State, they got a chance to win their conference and be in contention for that, you know, probably the 12 seed, the, the group five champion. Um, on Friday, UNLV Kansas is another one where UNLV is in that conversation as one of the top mid-majors. Um, that, that's one that, that kind of jumped out to me and, and I'm excited about. The, the Saturday slate, it's not like great in terms of star power, which means there's going to be weird stuff. The right. only ranked <laughs> matchup, Boston College against Missouri. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Mizzou has been pretty darn impressive so far. Boston College, I didn't have them ranked, but I could see why other people would. Um, this is a chance for Mizzou to finally get a big win. And then there's a there's a couple of cool rivalries here. Um, Oregon, Oregon State, the Civil War. Washington, Washington State, the Apple Cup. Sure. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that those t- games still exist after Oregon and Washington left their their little brothers behind in the Pac-2. Um, so, I, I, you know, the uh, you'd think that the Cougs and, and the Beavers would be very... Excited to try and uh, stick to the people who left him. Um, one more I'm going to throw out there, uh, Tulane, Oklahoma at, at 3.30. Tulane, to me, I thought acquitted themselves pretty well last week against Kansas State. Um, at, you know, they, they lost Michael Pratt, who's a quarterback you know uh, a tiny bit about, uh, uh, as I understand it, for the Bucks now. Um, have a new quarterback in Minsa who looked very good, at least at times. Um, Oklahoma did not impressed me at all last week against a Houston team that's not good. So that's one where Tulane could have OU on, on upset watch. And just the other tiny wrinkle here real fast, Tulane's got uh, one of the 10 most prolific receivers in the country so far, Mario Williams uh, from Plant City. Shout out to uh, East Hillsboro there. He started his career as a top 50 national rec- recruit at OU. So kind of going back to his old stomping grounds in a weird little twist there. But um, so yeah, those are some of the games that I'm kind of looking forward to, to paying attention to and what should be a, a good, weird Saturday, even if we don't necessarily see which games are going to be good and weird. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, that's the, that's what I love about college football. I mean, it, it, you still have the unpredictability. You have great stories everywhere. I'm trying to keep track of what quarterback is playing for what team these days. I'm, you Me know, too. <laughs> it, it's, it's just been kind of nuts, uh, to be honest with you. And, and we talked about this a little bit last week. I think that that is not always a, an easy, uh, sort of square peg round hole to fill sometimes. And I think, I, I, Matt, I have more concerns about college football that we can even get into right now uh, because it's a team sport, and I think it's very difficult to do some plug and play stuff. But uh, be that as it may, it's never dull, uh, and nope. uh, you know, absolutely, um, we love it for that reason. And and I, I'm hoping that 
you start to see, of course, Miami has, has started out well, but uh, USF certainly is looking still for a good season. But, man, it just seems so weird to see Florida and Florida State where they are right now. And I don't think they'll both stay there. Um, but the state, it's sort of like, what is the state of college football right now? Well, it's not very good, um, to say well, the there's, least. There, there's one other one, though, here. We haven't mentioned UCF, and I should have That's earlier. a great point. I haven't mentioned they, you're right. They might be Good or very good. I, I, I'm not willing to say that yet. You know, they kick the crap out of two bad teams, which, hey, th- that's what good teams do, right? You, you can only play the team on, on your schedule. And, and they put up a lot of points. The ground game looks excellent. Okay. They're at TCU on Saturday, 730. That's a game where, uh, okay, we're going to find out really quick whether UCF is, is legitimate or not. TCU is not great, right? Max Duggan's not walking through that door. Um, but TCU is good enough. And, and this is the first real test for UCF and, and Gus and, and KJ Jefferson this year. So I'm really curious to see whether UCF is, you know, they're able to beat the cupcakes or whether they're good enough to, you know, be one of the contenders in a Big 12 that still, to me, seems pretty wide open. Yeah, always fascinating. I mean, listen, uh, UCF, I mean, trying to get used to what the alignments are and the conferences and how they're going to do in the Big 12 and, of course, the SEC. Now, we didn't even mention what Texas did to Michigan last week, which I thought was very convincing. Texas, who's the, who's your best team in the country right now, Matt? I still think it's Georgia um, okay. because, I mean, they kicked the crap out of Clemson week one and then Clemson <laughs> kicked the crap out of App State <laughs> right. in, in right. week two. So, And then just, again, this is eye test stuff, right? Georgia's got dudes upon dudes upon dudes. Great quarterback, great skill. Uh, you know, uh, Starks in the secondary, really, really good all over the field. So I still have Georgia one. I've got Texas two, Ohio State three. We don't know yet on Ohio State. Again, they're like UCF; they haven't played anybody yet. But th- th- their games are their games are coming. Um, there's and then that's the top three, and then there's a there's a drop to me. Uh, Ole mm-hmm. Miss and Alabama, yeah, maybe you can put them in the top. But like, you know, Oregon, I don't know what to make of the Ducks yet. Um, not impressive in week one. Uh, beat Boise in week two. I, I tend to think Boise's pretty darn good. And so, but Oregon needed a little bit of fluky stuff in there. Um, so yeah, th- there's <laughs> we're at the point of the season where it's easy to start picking holes with teams and you know, everybody sucks except for, for Georgia and Ohio state and Texas. It, it's, it almost feels like we're, we're already at that point. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it's, uh, you got some super teams. All right. Well, we appreciate it as always. You can follow Matt Baker on Tampa Bay.com and in the Tampa Bay times does the best job of anyone writing college football. And he's good enough to join us here each week, Matt, enjoy the games. Thanks again. All right. Thanks Rick. I love that college football is so back and I get to wake up in the morning and listen to college game day and get ready for the Saturdays. And then, of course, on Sundays, it's about the NFL and the Bucks. Uh, great start so far. Baker Mayfield getting lots of love for player of the week and FedEx Pat, uh, air player of the week, all that stuff. Uh, so people are starting to realize there might be a pretty good team here in Tampa, but they've got injuries, obviously, and we know about those. We're going to find out more about them today when the Bucks go back to practice. We'll be there to talk to Todd Bowles. Um, and figure out, you know, just what they're going to do without Antoine Winfield Jr. in that secondary, whether Zion McCallum or any of those guys are going to be able to make it back, Eliza Cansey, et cetera. So lots of news you can check out on TampaBay.com, Tampa Bay Times. And then uh, the the Rays, eh, they kind of were going back and forth with the Phillies. They wind up losing 9-4. to They're now six back, I guess, in the wild card race, Steve. And uh, that's because the Twins were winning. So it looked like they were going to win as we – do this podcast um but ben, bench uh, is cleared in the game at the end yeah how about you that say the hitting nick castellanos mm-hmm. yeah. after the game was a little bit out of hand and yeah well things say happen, said man. he didn't mean to throw he said change up got away from him which you right. know, generally if you're trying to hit somebody you're not you're not gonna throw a change up, up. So. yeah exactly look at the pitch selection i mean that's the thing um never understood that really why uh why guys get offended sometimes that they you know Believe me, it's hard to stand out there and and throw that hard that long and then have every pitch go exactly where you want it to. But uh, it was uh, it's been you know they've been pitching well until tonight. They gave up too many runs. I mean the the thing that's gotten uh, Bradley lately is just the home run ball. He's just given up. And of course, he gave up a leadoff home run home run to uh, uh, to Schwabi. You know who's hit fourteen of them this year, which is 
unbelievable. So uh, tough break for the, for the Rays, but uh, they'll con- they'll continue on. And, and and look, they're running out of games. I don't think it's realistic to think they'll make the wild card, but we'll see. So your mailbag questions, get those in um, at Sports Day TV at NFL Stroud, or my email address is rstroud at tampabay.com. Thanks to Matt Baker. Thanks for listening. For Steve Burstick, I'm Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times. Have a great day, everybody.